remember how some of us used to combat loneliness? Why? We'd book a meeting! That's right, folks. Today's your lucky day. Let's book a meeting. Hear ye, hear ye. Come one, come all. Attend my meeting where I'll impress you with business terms like amplify and circle back. Why, I might even point a stick at a screen or blue sky some ideas on the old whiteboard. That's right, folks. Let's book a meeting. And now, back to your regularly scheduled program. I don't want to set the world on fire. But in all seriousness, loneliness and mental health in the workplace is no laughing matter. And that's what we're talking about today. I'm Jeff Livingston, and this is ADP Canada's Insights at Work podcast. Let's dive in. This is the podcast that looks at what's happening in the HR world, takes your questions and studies the research to help HR experts move forward. It's prepared by HR experts for HR experts. Over the last six months, we've seen unprecedented support from Canadian employers in the transition from our traditional office settings to remotely working from home. And I bet most of us feel pretty comfortable in our new home offices, supported by the latest technology and collaborative online tools. But I wonder how most of us are feeling. I mean, really feeling. Well, that's what we're talking about today. And joining us to share her insights into what's keeping the Canadian worker up at night is Paula Allen, Senior Vice President of Research, Analytics and Innovation for... Morneau Chappelle. Paula, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, Jeff. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you here. Paula, it looks like remote work is here to stay. We're entering the eight month of the pandemic and our daily routines have probably undergone what looks like the path of a roller coaster. During this time, ADP has been conducting surveys about the Canadian workers' thoughts on important topics like workplace safety, diversity, how they're handling the challenges of COVID-19 and what the future of work looks like. Now, we've spoken about our survey findings on past podcasts, and the findings, they're pretty revealing. But Morneau Chappelle also conducts surveys specific to the mental health of the Canadian workplace. And I think our listeners would love to hear about that research today. So can you fill us in on what the Morneau Chappelle Mental Health Index is? Uh, Thanks, Jeff. Well, the mental health index was something that we contemplated actually a number of years ago. So from our point of view, uh, Morna Chappelle supports organizations in supporting the health and productivity of their people. So we have a really clear insight into how important mental health is. So quality of life, work productivity for sure, uh, engagement, participation in the economy, like you name it, mental health actually touches it and influences it. So we thought that there was a huge gap in not having a clear measure of how we're doing as a population, how the working population in Canada is doing. So that's the purpose of the mental health index to give us that measure. And as luck would have it or luck wouldn't have it, uh, we had a pandemic around the same time that we launched. So we launched in April of 2020. And what, what the index shows is basically a deviation from our benchmark. So we took a period of time, 2017 to 2019, we're collecting a lot of data, we have a baseline. And in April, we were able to see where we were relative to that baseline and boy was there ever a massive decline like i we expected mental health to decline because we were going through so much of upheaval i don't think anybody expected it to be the level that we saw in april and we've we've continued actually to be fairly compromised even since then yep paula that doesn't sound like the most positive of news when i looked into it it seems that for the fifth consecutive month 
Two of the key drivers of the mental health index score are financial risk and isolation. And these two factors seem to account for the biggest mental health impacts or have contributed to a more difficult overall experience for workers throughout the pandemic. What is the relationship between these and why do you feel that they have such an impact? And Paula, do you think that there's particular industries or types of employees that are disproportionately affected? Yeah, so every month, uh, as you said, we do what we call a driver analysis to really sort of understand what is making the biggest difference in our mental health. So uh, the top two you mentioned, the number one uh, has each month been that financial uncertainty. So that level of uncertainty that the, uh, that the pandemic has brought has brought change and, and uh, you know, a lack of predictability in a lot of areas, but without question, even more than you know, fear of getting ill or fear of a loved one dying or changes in routine, that financial uncertainty is really weighing down heavily on us. Now, the other thing is we went a little deeper and we looked at people uh, in terms of, you know, really, again, what, what, uh, what else, what related to that makes a difference? And it's not just the uncertainty, but we actually find that whether or not somebody has emergency savings is a moderator for that uncertainty. So that, what that means is that if you have emergency savings, you know, it doesn't matter what your income is, you could have a fairly low income and have emergency savings, you're actually doing better than someone who even has a high income but doesn't have emergency savings. So having that nest egg, having that plan is, is really helping us from a psychological point of view as well as it would help us from a practical point of view. Now, the other thing each and every month that's coming up is isolation. And, you know, the, the thing is that, you know, people say, that the pandemic has really accelerated things that were already a problem or already an opportunity. And for sure, this isolation is one of them. We've been seeing for years that isolation is an increasing problem in our society. We've even had in in UK, like a Minister of Loneliness, um, Health Canada has spoken about it, the Surgeon General in the United States. We we know that it's a, a problem that impacts health, physical health, as well as mental health. And with this change in routines that we've had, you know, people are not able to connect in the way that they have. So it's really exacerbated the problem and and has put us in a crisis state with respect to that as well. Yep. I remember the Minister of Loneliness when that happened, and that was pretty forward thinking on Theresa May's part. It's obviously a challenge that affects a lot of countries, and it's neat to see that your survey only confirms the prevalence of this issue. Now, you also highlight that financial concerns are high on the list for mental health impacts, with 38% of Canadians saying as much. Paula, do you know which aspects of their finances are causing the greatest concern? And what can people do amidst this pandemic to address some of the impact that their finances are having on their mental health? Well, the main thing um, is really the savings, but the other thing is being having a sense of understanding and control over your finances. So again, pandemic has really kind of, it's disrupted us because it's really taken away that sense of control in a number of areas. So when people take stock of their finances, They look at what they truly do have and what they need to live and and achieve their goals. They develop contingency plans if things go in a negative way or if things go more positively. That sense of control, those actions that people can take are also helpful. So the emergency savings is important, but also the actions that people take to actually get a hold and understand and feel control of their finances. So doing nothing, you know, is definitely not what you want to do. Making sure that you are an active participant in your financial situation is really critically important right now. So ADP Canada's Workplace Insights Surveys 
recently found that while most Canadian employees felt their employers had responded to the pandemic the right way with new policies, with resources and timely communications, less than half of those respondents across all industries reported getting the additional mental health support they needed. Paula, what effects do you think this has had on employee mental health and business productivity over the long term, especially when we're looking at the Canadian workforce physically returning to the workplace this fall or maybe, let's say, January? Well, I I have an answer that's better than what I think. (laughs) I actually have uh, data to show what what this is, is doing. So, um, yes, we've had some employers really step up in an amazing way in understanding that, you know, this pandemic really threatens people, this really threatens their health, it really threatens their mental health. So, you know, there's there are a lot of employers who have really looked at that employee support and employee health support is central to their business continuity plan. And those employers those employers who have really invested in the mental health of their people, their people are doing better. So remember I said we had this massive decline in mental health as an overall population, but those employees who are working for employers who they feel really do support their mental health well, it's only a negligible decline from the way it was in 2019. And it's the correlation is so strong. So those who are inconsistent, their mental health is a little bit worse. Those who are ignoring mental health altogether as employers, their people are doing much, much worse. So we definitely have the data. And and I would really look to long term in terms of what that's going to do for those organizations, because the, the mental health issues that we are feeling now are imp- impacting us not only into in terms of our long term mental health, they're impacting us in terms of our short term productivity. They're, uh, they're putting us at risk in terms of how we actually care for our physical health. And there's a strong relationship between how you're doing mentally and how your body responds and how you care for your body. So the, 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 the risk going forward is higher health cost higher disability cost, much lower engagement because people remember how you treated them through a a crisis and a continuation of the drop in productivity that we've seen as people are, are feeling more compromised right now. It's great today to be talking about ways to support employee mental health. And I'm glad that you mentioned EAP, Employee Assistance Programs, and that they're available. Paula, can you expand just a bit about what an EAP is and how it helps not just the employer, but how it helps the employee? One of the most foundational programs is employee assistance programs. So what we found is a number of employers, again, have really stepped up and realized the importance of mental health and are not only promoting the employee assistance programs more, but offering it to people in their workplace who never had access before, such as part-time and contract workers. So these are people who don't have the other benefits, but they need that support in order to continue to provide customer service and continue to show up. And it actually shows how much the employer cares about people under, under their virtual roof. Um, the other thing that we uh, offer and that has been very important in terms of getting through this is training for managers. So again, things are very disruptive. Managers are feeling that disruption and also have to manage their teams that might be in in various levels of of, of upheaval. And, And really the employer ease experience is largely channeled through their experience with their direct supervisor, no matter what HR programs or other things you you have. So we've skilled those managers in understanding mental health issues in a way that a manager should understand, not a a clinician, Um, how to sort of identify when somebody might not be doing so well, and most importantly, what to do about it. So how to be supportive, how to make sure that you can help that person to their next step without taking on the role of a a clinician and the types of things 
that are helpful in terms of maintaining a mentally healthy team, especially during this time of upheaval where people need a lot of flexibility and they, they actually need a fair bit more recognition than they did before. It's great to see that there's manager training that helps them watch out for those signs of deteriorating mental health in a colleague. And I think we all can keep an eye out for some of those signs. Paula, what are some of the signs that HR professionals and managers should be on the lookout for? Well, the biggest thing is when you're noticing a change. So you see someone and there's a bit of a change in their behavior. There's a change in their energy. Um, they might be uh, not getting as much work done within a particular point in time. They might be acting a little bit differently towards their co coworkers, perhaps becoming more dominant or controlling or passive. Uh, any sort of change is, is really a, a, a bit of a red flag. And I think what's important is that we don't necessarily know what's driving that change. It could be that they're struggling from a mental health point of view. It could be that they're struggling from practical issues that may or may not ultimately impact their mental health. But I always say that we were born with much more wisdom than we give ourselves credit for. When that little, you know, light comes up in your mind that something's not quite right, almost always it's correct. And almost always the best thing to do is just to have a conversation with the person and tell them what you're seeing, then tell them that you see a change, do it in a supportive way, you know, let them know that you care about them and their well-being and uh, is there an, an open up a conversation around if there's anything that needs to be done from a workplace point of view, flexibility, clarity or whatever, and remind them of the EAP if there's an opportunity to do that. So we've been throwing around the term EAP today. Paula, could you just quickly describe what's the difference between an EAP and a traditional benefits program? Sure, and some people think of employee assistance as a version of benefits, but it, it does function differently. So uh, if you have psychological benefits, as many of us do in our um, benefit plan, uh, you go out, you find a provider, a psychologist, social worker, a therapist, and if that person's credentials are covered under your plan, you can get some support and you can get reimbursement for any of the expenses that you uh, that you incur as a result of, of, of getting that support. Um, so usually there is a cap on the number of, of uh, uh, usually there's a cap on the amount. Uh, thankfully, a lot of employers are increasing that cap right now, but it's a, it's a reimbursement model. Uh, employee assistance program functions a bit differently. Uh, so there's a 24-7, you know, 365 day uh, access point, either through a telephone or an app, and you can get support immediately. So, you know, if you're in crisis, and unfortunately we've had an increase in crisis calls since the pandemic, you can have a counselor on the line with you immediately. Um, if you are, if, if you uh, have a range of issues, so it's not just you need a counselor, but you also need somebody to help you with your finances. You need someone to help you with childcare. You need a legal consult. EAP has a number of different resources that you can have access to. So it's you know counseling for sure, but a range of other resources. And probably what's most important to, to people is it's not only you know, very confidential, but there's no cash outlay that the employee has to pay. It's completely covered by the employer and the employer is the one that gets billed for the services, not the employee. So there's no need to reimburse. So I've experienced firsthand the benefits of an EAP program. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight it on the podcast today. Services like legal advice or securing daycare for my daughter or even helping prepare a will were just some of the products that my EAP provider offered. Now, for those professionals who haven't set up an EAP provider in their company, how is it billed to the employer, Paula? Well, first of all, it's pretty pretty cost effective. Like we're looking at about one percent of what you would pay in your typical the typical benefits package. So it's a fairly comprehensive and cost effective model, largely because there's there's really good volume in it because so many employers do offer it uh, to their people. And uh, typically, the way it's billed 
is that you pay a certain amount on a monthly basis, depending on how many employees have access to the service. So there's some nuances in terms of how you can structure it, but that's the basic billing model. All right, last question before we get to your list of favorite things. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw employers implement policies and safeguards for physical health. Now, what do you think employers should be doing to prioritize and support employee mental health with that same vigor and speed that they did when the pandemic first hit? Well, the first is understanding the reality of the situation, which is we, as the working population in Canada, are in a crisis state right now. So that has came across loud and clear in terms of our mental health index. So again, we've, we've uh, declined 12 points in April. We've barely increased since then. We're uh, minus 10 points now. And really what that means is that the population on average is feeling as distressed as the most distressed 1% of the working population prior to the pandemic. So what that means in very practical terms is, and we've seen it in our numbers as well, we're having a decline in productivity. So to explain that, we've seen in some surveys that people are actually saying productivity is the same or has even increased since people are working from home. And when you look under the numbers, largely the reason for that is that people are working more hours. The way we looked at it is how effective is each hour? How much are you getting done and how much are you being distracted by thoughts, emotions, practical challenges? And that's where we realized that there was a significant decline. So that's number one, because those extra hours that people are working are not gonna be sustainable forever. The second point is that we have found also, um, and this is also reflective of the fact that we're in a crisis situation, that four in 10, almost four in 10 of, of our, our Canadian working population is feeling less motivated at work than they were in 2019. And that's a, that's a, that's a signal that people are feeling drained. So that, 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 that lack of sustainability that I had mentioned before is showing itself. There's emotional burden, uh, as a result of all the changes, the lack of predictability, you know, the changes in your family income in, in many ways, you know, just the upheaval that we've, we've, we've uh, experienced has again put us all at risk. And we're seeing that right now in the level of motivation. So that's an important thing for organizations to pay attention to because that's such a flag for burnout. And we don't wanna see that at the other end of this, 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 this tunnel. So one, one thing I would say is that the purpose of the mental health index is to bring forward information so people will take action. So I'm really hoping that employers see the fact that this is not business as usual, that the pandemic has impacted mental health. It's not even a risk of a group, impacted mental health, and we have a risk of future compromises, future costs, future disruption, unless we act now. Well, I think we can all look to the mental health index as a tool to gauge how the Canadian worker is feeling and to also help guide our HR policies and practices in supporting those employees. So let's shift gears. Are you ready to do a rapid fire list of your favorite things? My, my favorite things? <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, let's go for it. All right, let's start with what's your favorite tool to help get work done? PowerPoint. <laughs> It helps me with creativity because I actually like to see pictures and graphics. Well, a picture is worth a thousand words and you can never have enough star wipes. All right, second question. What's your favorite resource to go to for industry information? Uh, journals, uh, basically academic journals on the issues that impact the industry. So I focus on uh, research and mental health, and I'm always wanting to keep ahead of ahead of that. And I also spend a lot of time looking at Benefits Canada and a number of other uh, and, and a number of other resources. Okay, great. Always good to be on the up and up with what's happening in the industry. Let's get a little personal. What's your favorite music album of all time? My favorite music album 
is, <laughs> please don't laugh at me, uh, Off the Wall by Michael Jackson. Well, a classic indeed, and I'm sure most of us had Off the Wall, and we also had Thriller. All right, last one. Your favorite piece of advice that you'd give to someone who's just starting out in their career? Be flexible and pay attention. Uh, I think a lot of people have very rigid ideas around what should happen or shouldn't happen. And work situation is so malleable. It's changing all the time, but you're also changing all the time. So just making sure that you pay attention and that you have the flexibility to make the right decisions at the right time. Well, I'm sure that we've all changed just a little bit for the better because of your great advice today, Paula. And with that last question, it looks like we've run out of racetrack. Paula, it has been such an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And this is the part of the podcast where I thank everyone for listening in. I know it's tough to find time to carve out for thought leadership, and I appreciate you, the listener for making the time for us. Anything we can do to help ourselves get better at something is time well spent. On our next episode, we'll be talking with more HR experts about today's most important HR issues. I'm Jeff Livingston. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be kind. We'll see you soon on our next episode of ADP's Insights at Work.